Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. After today's presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions, and at that time, you may press star then one on your phone's keypad to ask a question. I would now like to turn the call over to your host for today, Ms. Nikki Grimsley. As a reminder, today's conference call is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect now. Ms. Grimsley, you may begin. Thank you, Vlad. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Nikki Grimsley with the Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity, or COCA, with the Division of Emergency Operations at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We are delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, Advancing the One Health Concept Through Collaborations that Connect, Create, and Educate. COCA is excited to offer this call in partnership with the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. We are pleased to have with us today Dr. Cheryl Stroud. You may participate in today's presentation by audio, via webinar, or you may download the slides if you are unable to access the webinar. The PowerPoint slide set and the webinar link can be found on our COCA webpage at emergency.cdc.gov forward slash co. A. Free continuing education is offered for this COCA call. Instructions on how to work, on how to earn continuing education will be provided at the end of this call. CDC, our planners, presenter, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. Planners have reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. This presentation will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. At the end of the presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask a question to the presenter. You may press star 1 on the phone to put yourself in a queue for questions or you may submit questions to the webinar system at any time during the presentation by selecting the Q&A tab at the top of the webinar screen and typing in your question. At the conclusion of today's session, you will be able to describe the disciplines that are included in One Health, define the challenges to instituting a One Health approach, identify the major global One Health leader organizations and groups, and discuss how the One Health Commission is working to connect stakeholders to create One Health action teams that educate about One Health and the issues surrounding it. Our presenter today is Dr. Cheryl Stroud. Dr. Stroud has both veterinary and basic research backgrounds, holding both a DVM and a PhD in basic endocrinology physiology with professional experiences in industry, academic research and training, private veterinary practice, and One Health leadership. Her primary focus is educating locally, nationally, and internationally about One Health. Dr. Stroud believes strongly in the value of interdisciplinary collaboration. Her forte is bringing together people across disciplines. At this time, we welcome Dr. Stroud. Dr. Stroud, please go ahead. Hi, thank you very much, Nikki. It's a real privilege and honor to be able to address this group in the COCA call system. And I thank the um, ACDPM for helping um, uh, the invitation and make this uh, event possible. I hope to, um, if you could go to the next slide, please, Nikki. And since I can't really see the system, um, we're going to have to go a little bit, um, a little bit by faith here. So. What, what I'd like to do uh, is give you a very, uh, for some of you, I know you're possibly not terribly familiar with One Health. So if there are any of you um, clinicians who have tuned in to find out what this is all about, I hope that we'll answer some of those questions. I'll give you a very brief historic overview, some updates on One Health around the world and why it really matters to all of us. Next slide, Nikki. One point that I would really like for you to walk away from this presentation with is that collaborations start with relationships. They don't just magically form. And those relationships don't just magically happen. They start when we are able to come together in direct conversations. Next slide, Nikki. So we're looking at um, two concentric circles here. Um, we tend to have uh, a tendency to think of we humans as um, the center of everything. The Earth is the center of the universe and we're the most important species when really and truly we're just part of a, an ecological continuum. 
I love this quote by Ann Drurian, who happens to be Carl Sagan's wife. Um, that we all have this, we, we as humans have this ego need to make, uh, to, to think that we are the center of the universe. Next slide, Nikki. We have a lot of um, ability as humans to have a, a very negative impact on our planet. Um, we, from these slides, you can tell that we are definitely on an unsustainable pathway here. We cannot sustain the way we're going now, and that's part of what we'll talk about today is kind of reframing our attitude of our place on Earth. Next slide, Nikki. So just what is this whole One Health um, concept all about? Uh, some of you may find it new. Um, some of you on the call are here just because you want to hear um, what what is going on in the One Health world. It's a concept. It's a very old concept, but it is a new professional imperative. Next slide. The scope of One Health involves so many disciplines, and we really need to include them all, from anthropology and agriculture to um, zoonotic disease and infectious diseases, the human-animal bond, professional education, I won't read all of these for you, comparative medicine, food and water safety, uh, disease surveillance, clinical medicine, the need for the interrelationships between our professions, environmental contaminants, biodiversity, disaster preparedness, public policy. Next slide, Nikki. One point that I'd really like for us all to walk away with is that One Health is actually a pathway to planetary health and to global security. It's something we don't talk about often enough that, that providing um, healthy um, populations uh, or unhealthy populations can undermine the stability of governments around the world. So it really can be a path not only to planetary health but to global security. Next slide, Nikki. I like this slide because it's taken at night and you can see the uh, areas of dense population around the world. Our population right now is somewhere around 7.2 billion and of course you've all heard the, the statistic, the projected statistic that will hit 9 billion by 2050. Um, actually the World Bank I think is saying now that we'll hit that by 2042. Next slide, Nikki. But when you look at that map and you um, realize how we're going to have to feed this world, it puts a whole new slant on the idea of food security. And I meant to use the slide that had food and water security because I'm quite concerned that we'll be um, dealing with water insecurity, or some countries already are, and I hope that we don't end up fighting wars over water. Next slide, Nikki. So infectious disease is a large part of the One Health conversation, but it's not the only part. So I'd like to give you some um, quick overviews of the many um, arenas under the purview of One Health. Um, for example, the infectious disease, the zoonotic disease, salmonellosis, which is quite common in chickens. Um, I'd just like to point out that one thing that we can do as clinicians, uh, especially as human uh, clinicians, is to be always asking the questions of your patients. Did you have exposure to backyard chickens or to small turtles? And I'm sure most of us already do that. But you'll just notice, next slide, Nikki, from this um, slide that is from the CDC, that the incidence of um, salmonellosis is by far highest in our very young children. So we have to be um, paying very close attention to that. Next slide, Nikki. Another uh, aspect of One Health is the human-animal bond. Um, I don't know if you guys can see. I love the one with the antidepressant with all the puppies all piling on. Um, I don't know if you can see the slide at the bottom, if you can read the bottom middle slide where it says, Warning, Chicken-Fested Area. If our pets go into those tall grasses and pick up ticks or fleas and then get in our beds with us, um, we're sharing our environment and our pets uh, in a very uh, intimate way, and they can actually bring ticks into our, um, our environment that expose us to zoonotic diseases. Next slide, Nikki. And of course, the human-animal bond and our human-animal interactions are not always our smartest um, uh, behaviors, um, but we are very aware that pets can promote public health, that um, owning pets and the interactions with animals can be very positive for our mental well-being and for obesity prevention. You've probably all heard of the program Walk a Hound, Lose a Pound. Next slide, Nikki. And there's actually a term now called nature deficit disorder that is being used for some of our children who just don't get any access to, um, to being in the great outdoors and being exposed to nature. We're actually starting to see the use of ecotherapy, getting people out into nature uh, to treat depression. Next slide. 
And whether it's a companion animal or a food animal, these human-animal interactions and bondings are very strong. Some of you will remember back in the early 2000s when the foot and mouth disease um, uh, crisis hit in the UK and so many herds of um, food animals had to be destroyed and we had farmers committing suicide because some of them had spent their lives breeding up uh, special lines of, of their animals that were very attached to them. So these are very powerful connections. Next slide. It's also um, a part of the human-animal interaction is um, the fact that uh, animal abuse can be linked to domestic violence. There's actually an organization called the National Link Coalition that uh, tries to focus attention on the fact that um, if a veterinarian sees an instance of animal abuse, that the people in those environments may also be at risk. Next slide. Some states actually have mandatory reporting of uh, whether you're an animal clinician, uh, reporting any aspects of animal abuse. And so we would find that being able as veterinarians to help people that we might suspect being in a similar situation as the animal might be seen that looks to be abused or neglected, um, trying to help those people connect with services that um, could help them with their situations. Next slide. Also under the One Health umbrella is the, the um, climate change and environmental contaminants. Um, you probably have heard in the news that our bees around the world are very threatened, and in some countries they're actually having to, to hand pollinate crops. And the next slide, please. And the monarch butterflies are having a difficult problem, a difficult time because of climate change and loss of habitat, and also because of insecticides in the environment. Next slide. Animals can be sentinels for what we're being exposed to in our environment. Um, you know that there was a this lead water crisis in Flint this year, and actually um, they were testing dogs in that environment to see if they could find evidence for lead poisoning. And in some cases, they did. Um, this is a picture of uh, a, uh, a veterinary students and veterinary technicians taking the samples from dogs. And, and the, some of those, um, some of the dogs in that environment were actually could be sentinels. And we should pay attention to the opportunity to use animals as sentinels in some of our public health situations. Next slide. Um, it's become apparent that cats might have been a sentinel for some endocrine disruptors in our environment, such as flame retardants, um, such as the polybrominated diphenyl ethers, the PVDEs. When I finished veterinary school um, in the early 80s, I wasn't taught anything about hyperthyroid cats. We started diagnosing those in the veterinary world in the late 80s, and it turns out that somebody noticed that that's when flame retardants were introduced into so many of our upholsteries and, and carpets and um, the hard plastics of our computers. Uh, it turns out there actually have been studies to show a very high correlation of when that was uh, introduced into the environment and when we started diagnosing cats with hyperthyroidism because it is such a powerful endocrine disruptor. Next slide. Um, that's, there have been studies, uh, Heather Stapleton at Duke have also studied this in young children and have found uh, fairly high levels of this in young children. And it's being postulated now that because these are endocrine disruptors, that they could actually be um, contributing to our obesity um, um, uh, epidemic and crisis in this country, especially young, young people. Next slide. So it's even been postulated that some of the antibiotics and the antibiotic residues in our environment could be contributing to obesity in people. And next slide, Nikki. Um, so I love this graphic of when we go from you know, skinny to, to some of our um, obesity situations today, uh, that is, there could be links to this in our environment. So these are some pretty uh, real instances of um, our intersection. Next slide, Nikki. There was actually even um, um, the National Academies who, who um, does all these workshops on topics of great concern. Um, they did an, uh, a workshop on the interplay between environmental chemical exposures and obesity. Next slide, Nikki. Another very large um, part of the One Health conversation is comparative medicine and translational research. Um, for example, the glioblastoma, the brain tumor, is exactly the same in humans and animals. 
And so there are some foundations that are trying to point out that if we could find these naturally occurring tumors in dogs, uh, cats, or other companion or other animals, and study them in the animals who have much shorter lifespan and are much uh, more easily um, perform research on that we can le learn a lot for both the hum humans and the animals. And then there are the organizations, uh, if you'll notice, the, the dog, and the, the brown dog in the top of the right. That's Olin, who's being trained to sniff out ovarian cancer. There are dogs being trained to sniff out cancers. Not that we would take dogs into clinical settings to sniff out cancers, um, but that if we can figure out what the aromatized um, compounds are that the dogs are able to pick up with their incredible sense of smell, that we might could then um, create technology uh, to, to, to detect, especially things like ovarian cancer, which are so difficult to find early. Next slide. Osteosarcomas, it turns out, the progenitor cells of osteosarcomas are exactly identical in, in dogs and people. And people like Will Uwert and others are studying these cells and how we can turn um, canine clinical trials to advance uh, cancer therapies. Next slide. And in fact, um, scientists have tested nanoparticle drug delivery in dogs with osteosarcoma. And a lot of people believe that dogs actually make a lot better research model for things that are going to be applied to humans than the mouse or the rat. So that's a, a, another uh, area where we're, we're needing to, to closely work together across disciplines. Next slide. Pet dogs um, have been used to test uh, all sorts of drugs. This happens to be an anti-aging drug. Uh, again, I'm pointing out that we're starting to realize that uh, dogs can be a great research model. There was even uh, another one of those National Academies workshops on the role of clinical studies for pets naturally occurring tumors and translational, translational cancer research. Next slide. And within the NIH, there's actually the Comparative Oncology Program, which um, has set up comparative oncology trials all around the country to, um, to do just that, to work across the disciplines and um, try to translate information from human to animal domains and vice versa. Next slide. And then there's Dr. Barbara Nelson Horwitz and her um, co-author, uh, Catherine Bowers, and there's the Ubiquity Initiative where um, they have been trying. Barbara has written this book to educate her colleagues, her, her medical colleagues, that we have a lot of commonality in disease processes uh, across the human and animal domain. Uh, she was all shocked to realize that some MDs don't realize that cats and dogs get diabetes and a lot of the same um, maladies that we deal with in the human world. So she wrote the book and has been, has been uh, running these conferences now for a number of years to bring that information to the human domain. So next slide, Nikki. We've taken uh, information from the human domain and applied it to the animal de domain for years. It hasn't gone so much the other way, which is, is one of the things that we're trying to open the conversation for so that we can, um, can get the, the, the information flowing both ways. So, um, this happens to be an application of um, prostheses, though, that we probably learned the technology first in humans and then applied it to animals. Next slide. Vector-borne diseases are uh, another very large and important uh, part of the One Health conversation. It's right there at the intersection of the environment, um, the zoonotic diseases, the humans, the animals. Some of these diseases have to vector um, with a, an insect that they go through um, an animal and often end up in the people. Uh, so um, things like anaplasmosis, babesiosis, bartonellosis, borreliosis, which often is referred to as Lyme disease, leishmaniasis, which I think is one of our um, neglected diseases. Uh, I think it's a, a very dangerous disease carried by sand flies, the Rocky Mountain spotted fever. You probably are all very familiar with these. I don't pretend to be an entomologist or a specialist on all the different kinds of insects, but um, I do know that we need to be talking to each other across our disciplines to deal with these diseases. I like to teach One Health with stories um, about that really kind of bring home the message of uh, why it's important, even why what the economic value is of having this One Health conversation and interaction. So this is a story that actually was published um, in uh, Veterinary Medicine and Mind Over Miller. Some of you may be familiar with Robert Miller, um, who is a veterinary cartoonist and a column writer. Uh, has a lot of insights. This is a story he wrote about his daughter. This is not a picture of his daughter. It's just an anonymous image. Next slide. So she was a, a journalist, and she went to Ecuador to do some of her journalism 
uh, and writing. And two weeks after returning home, she had swollen joints and seed and skin lesions and discolored fingernails and shortness of breath. On radiographs, she had lung lesions. They also detected granulomatous visceral lesions. Next slide. Her dad was at a veterinary meeting and was telling some of his colleagues what was going on with his daughter, and um, they told her that told him that she probably had a vector-borne disease and should take some some um, doxycycline, or she had a parasite and should take some ivermectin. Um, but in the process, he learned about Dr. Ed Bright's work um, studying the vector-borne disease lab at NC State. Long story short, this this young woman saw over a period of two years, saw 76 specialists, had 10 CT scans, and received a whole bunch of diagnoses. Um, the most concerning was the gastrointestinal stromal, stromal tumors. So they talked to her doctors into sending some blood samples to Dr. Bright's work lab um, because they just, you know, this had been going on for two years and she had been suffering and they were about to take her to surgery to, you know, do an exploratory surgery to find out what was going on. At this point, I usually ask people if they have any ideas what it was uh, they found. And if you know Dr. Bright's work, you'll probably get this very quickly. But if you don't know Dr. Bright's work and his work, then you may not get this one. So the next slide, please. They found Martinella in this young woman, and it's, um, it's a disease, a zoonotic disease, and it is required to pass through a vector. Um, many of them pass through fleas. I'm not sure exactly what the specific vector is for the Vinsonia. It's probably some kind of... Um, um, a tick, it's often um, she could have been exposed to, but she had a lot of bug bites when she came back. So when, the next slide, Nikki, when they went to surgery, the surgeon came out after the surgery and said they didn't find any evidence of malignancy, and her dad um, answers, well, I never thought she had a malignancy. I believe she has bartonellosis. And the surgeon said, well, I'm a surgeon. I don't know what bartonellosis is. Um, and so it just this story points out our incredible need for having ways to share information um, across all the um, um, different facets of our professions, in both the human and the animal side. So the question here is, you know, how much money and suffering could have been saved for this young woman had her radiologist very early on been um, linked into the literature that would make him aware that this organism could cause these kinds of lesions. So. That's just one story, one illustration of how we need to be sharing information across um, species, across um, disciplines. And next slide, making Another one of the vector-borne diseases that we're needing to learn more about and share information across um, our disciplines is the Palisson virus, which I don't know a whole lot about yet. Um, but you can see that it, we're starting to uh, identify it in more and more states. Next slide, Nikki. Um, the antimicrobial resistance question is a quintessential One Health issue. Um, Dr. Larkin has written, has spent five years researching and writing this book, One Health and the Politics of Antimicrobial Resistance. If you guys are interested, we did host a, a couple of webinars where she was talking about her findings for this book, and you'll, you'll find them on the One Health Commission website and the library um, under webinars. Um, so Dr. Kahn believes very strongly that um, we need to kind of rethink how we're approaching this, quit pointing, pointing fingers uh, across the human and animal sectors. She does not believe that um, and, and that agriculture is a main culprit in driving in microbial resistance. One of the largest um, things that came out of research was an awareness of the environmental impacts of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, next slide, Nikki. So we're just starting to realize that antimicrobial antibiotic resistance um, is having a huge impact in our soil microbiome. It's impacting our plants. It is changing our gut flora. Um, it's, we're finding antimicrobial resistant organisms in our marine mammals who have never been given antibiotics. Um, one of the things that Dr. Kahn points out is that in 2016 there are still very large numbers of countries and, and humans that are open defecating, and those are often the same countries that are using antibiotics that they get over the counter with no medical oversight. And all of that's getting washed into our um, into our oceans, so that we're affecting our our our, our oceanic eco environment. Next slide. One another area of the One Health conversation is disaster preparedness. Um, so this is just an, an international disaster database that um, you might be interested in. Next slide. One major lesson that we learned of Katrina was you don't show up without 
animal carriers because there were so many people who would not leave their homes if their animals could not go with them. So this is one of the um, arenas that we need to pay attention to and are paying attention to now because now we make arrangements. We're starting, at least in this country, to make arrangements for getting the animals out, too. Next slide, Nikki. So there is a question in that, in that um, vein of thought, is animal relief um, humanitarian relief? So the question comes up, if we go in and, and help save the people but don't save the animals in many countries, that animals are their livelihood and there's nothing for them to go back to if you don't rescue the animals too. So in many instances, um, the animal relief is humanitarian relief. Next slide. So all professions are needed for us to make this, to make One Health the default way of doing business, and that's at all levels of research and clinical practice and in governments and in policy. So everything from agriculturalists to wildlife specialists, uh, anthropologists, plant pathologists, social scientists, especially the social scientists and behaviorists, the engineers and entomologists, we all need to find ways to come together. Next slide. Because we've gotten so entrenched in our silos, if you think about it, very, very early on in Early, early history, a healer was a healer and healed, you know, whatever came along that needed healing. And then we got so specialized and we've had, we've developed the incredible technological ability to study this amino acid and this strand of DNA. And we've kind of lost the uh, awareness and willingness and ability to reach across our silos and stay in touch with the larger picture. That's one of our system's challenges. Next slide, Nikki. We have so many challenges for this, for making this One Health, um, the One Health movement or One Health concept, the default way of doing business. Our academic tenure process don't encourage transdisciplinary work. If you don't publish in the most elite journal, you might not be able to to um, to get tenure as easily. Our government agencies are in, very much in silos and don't communicate very easily across those silos. In industry and private industry and research, um, there's proprietary knowledge and you know, there's not a real willingness to share um, information. Our environmental resources harvesting systems are detrimental and destructive. Some of our agricultural technology is destructive. And here's the, the publication systems. This is one of the largest challenges for us having, for us really doing this One Health, um, the One Health concept. We have no access to each other's literature. If you think about it, the um, professional associations usually publish the journals, and if you don't belong to that professional association, you don't have access to those to that literature. So there are um, we are starting to have some open access publications that's going to help us a lot, but we have a long a long way to go. And finally, there are language barriers across our professions. We all have our acronyms, and, and believe it or not, um, especially among the older generation, it's, it can be a little intimidating to talk to our colleagues in other disciplines because they might say something that we don't understand and we might look stupid because we don't know that acronym. Next slide. So it's a real wake-up call for us to um, realize that we need a way to communicate and learn across disciplines. Next slide. So here's a real quick historic overview. The Wildlife Conservation Society started holding um, um, One Health meetings back in 2004. And in 2007, the AVMA and AMA partnered in a One Health Initiative Task Force. In 2008, the FAO, OIE, WHO, and UNICEF and the World Bank all worked together to develop joint pandemic flu response plans. And when they were starting to realize, oh, my gosh, we really need to put these relationships in place ahead of time before a crisis because a crisis or a medical emergency or, or a disaster is a really bad time to start exchanging business cards for your colleagues that you need to be working with across disciplines and especially across government and policy um, offices. Next slide. In 2008, the, um, a group of individuals stood up and started uh, stood up a, a website known as the One Health Initiative and started disseminating grassroots One Health information. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to this group because they have done an enormous amount to um, to help uh, make the whole world aware of this concept and the significance uh, and significant impact that it can have. Next slide. So I'm on the slide now that says 2009 at the top. Um, in 2009, the One Health Office was established in CDC and USAID started its Emerging Pandemic Threats Program. And um, the, there, was, there started being more uh, meetings around uh, the world for One Health, and the commission was chartered as a 501c3. The One Health Commission was chartered in 2009. 
So um, next slide, Nikki, um, skip on down to the, the next slide with the executive summary of the One Health Commission. That same year in 2009 that the One Health Commission was stood up, um, there was a, a joint meeting with the National Academies of Science in Washington, D.C. on, on um, this whole One Health concept, and it was a pretty exciting time to, um, to realize that that was some of the early bringing of this whole One Health concept to Washington, D.C., and starting to bring, uh, work it into the lawmakers' consciousness. Next slide, Nikki. Um, in 2010, there was a tripartite, it's referred to as a tripartite One Health note that was uh, signed and brought forward by the uh, OIE and FAO and WHO. Next slide. I've got to go quickly through this um, history. 2011 was the first International One Health Congress in Melbourne. 2012 was the, US, uh, the USDA established a One Health Office. 2013, the second International One Health Congress was held in, in uh, conjunction with the Prince Mahidol Award Conference in Bangkok, Thailand. Next slide, 2014, the International One Health Research Symposium was held in China. 2015 was the third International One Health Congress uh, in, in the Netherlands, and the World Medical Association, World Veterinary Association had a joint meeting. And they're going to be having another one of those. If you can go to the next slide, Nikki, you'll see that this year, in fact, in just a week or so, in um, December 3 through 7, is the fourth International One Health Congress, uh, One Health Eco Health, and they're down in Melbourne again. And that this year um, they've just completed, a few days ago, the second World Veterinary Association, World Medical Association Joint One Health Congress in Japan. Next slide. In 2015, the International One Health Platform was set up. This is a very research-oriented group that uh, saw a need for oversight for some of these international congresses. And so that now they're planning them going forward. And um, they've also uh, created and opened uh, with El uh, a One Health journal that, that is um, open to publication of all arenas of One Health. So what can we do? Next slide, Nikki. We all need, see the need for this. We just don't always know what to do about it. So that's a real challenge for us, and um, this is where I hope you'll get some take-home ideas. Next slide, Nikki. One of the things we saw a huge need to begin with was to help us identify who's doing what for One Health all around the world. You'll see this map down in the bottom left again later. That happens to be um, one of the maps of all the events for One Health Day. So we have a Who's Who in One Health page on the One Health Commission website, and we'd love for you to help us keep populating that. We hope for our map on the right to eventually evolve into the map uh, uh, like the one on the left. Next slide, Nikki. Um, we have a, a, a large listserv, as do some of the other One Health groups. We'd love for you to get on this listserv. You can do that under resources. Um, join the, the global One Health community listserv. We're now sharing um, One Health happenings, news notes with um, everybody on the listserv, and those are getting circulated around the world to help get some of the happenings and job opportunities that are going on in the One Health community out there. Next slide. In 2014, we did the first international Who's Who in One Health uh, webinar, and it was pretty amazing. Over a 1,000 people from over 40 countries tuned in for that webinar, which happened to run for almost 10 hours. Um, I was amazed how many people stayed with us for the whole time. If you would like to, you can go listen to the recordings. If you'd really like to learn more about what's going on around the world for One Health, uh, you can go and look at the recordings there. You'll find it under events. And then just on November 4 this year, we had a second international who's who in One Health as an additional contribution to One Health Day. And so that was also uh, a very um, uh, enlightening to see what's going on in very uh, a lot of countries around the world. And we certainly haven't hit everybody yet. We'll have to keep doing this for quite a while because there's so much going on around the world. Next slide, Nikki. So I just grabbed a lot of the uh, logos that are um, associated with groups advocating and, and working for One Health. Um, this is just a handful of them. It's just the ones I could grab very quickly. So I'm trying to give you the impression here that this has really caught on around the world. Next slide, Nikki. Another thing that we're working on is identifying areas that need some them, um, to increase the conversation around them, things like understanding Bartonella. So we're providing um, webinar educational opportunities around those topics. We also, as I mentioned, did one with Dr. Khan, um, two of them with Dr. Khan on antimicrobial resistance um, and antimicrobial resistance in the environment. And just not too long ago, we, we did a webinar on cystic cirrhosis. Um, with another one of those uh, diseases that we really need to get more information and more change in behaviors around um, like open defecation and how animals and human um, um, excrement come into contact. So these are just 
some of the, the educational things that we're working on. Uh, next slide, Nikki. Uh, the commission, uh, we all feel it's extremely important to train the next generation of One Health leaders. So we find it very important to support so many students who are working who are very passionate about One Health and many different disciplines. And students really get this and they haven't gotten deeply entrenched in their silos yet. And they're not intimidated to go talk to other um, young people who are training across disciplines. So students are our future and we've got to support their efforts and their ability to form relationships across disciplines early in their in their careers because those relationships will go with them for the rest of their career. Uh, next slide, Nikki. The, um, the One Health Commission is, is identifying areas that need something, uh, need some action and then trying to create One Health action teams to address those things. These are volunteers who have some passion for an arena that they would like to help do something about. Um, one of, just an example of one of those action teams is our Bat Rabies Education Team. Uh, the Commission had partnered back in 2012-2013 with the Global Alliance for Rabies Control and Bat Conservation International and created these posters because we realized that, at least in the Americas, where bats are um, a major harbinger of um, rabies, that um, nobody was educating children and parents not to touch a bat, or if they had an exposure to a bat, to let some health um, professional know about it. So I can I could give you story after story of people who had um, an incident, an, an encounter, or an exposure to a bat who didn't realize that they should take precautions because they didn't know that bats could carry rabies. So this team is now trying to get these posters in front of children and parents all around the country, and I uh, would love for anybody who would like to be involved to help us do that. Next slide, Nikki. Some of you are aware that back in um, uh, early 2015 that um, uh, Senator Al Franken and uh, other Senators sent a letter to the White House urging the President to create a One Health platform and to help create a United Nations One Health platform. Uh, next slide, Nikki. The, the Commission followed up with its uh, own letter to the White House uh, urging the same thing. Uh, we opened us, uh, ours up to signatures from the One Health community and only circulated it for about two weeks. I still think I need to go and fix it so people could still sign on to that. Um, and we actually um, kind of expanded on the idea and gave us uh, some suggestions of what it could look like and how it could work um, at, the, at the local, the state, the federal, and the international level for a One Health platform. Next slide, Nikki. And some of you may be aware that this year on March the 3rd that Senator Franken's office actually put forward a One Health bill to establish an interagency One Health program. Um, this is a very infectious disease-oriented bill, and it, it needs a little language to help everybody understand that One Health is not just about infectious diseases. But I understand why they did it on the heels of Ebola of trying to, you know, to, you know kind of ride a, a current of interest to um, bring awareness to One Health and some of the things that we need to be doing um, policy-wise on the One Health front. Next slide. And, of course, we just had uh, One Health Day. It was our first inaugural One Health Day. It was a partnership team effort between the One Health Commission, the One Health Initiative, and the One Health Platform with participation with so many One Health groups around the world. Uh, and so you'll notice this map that you saw earlier. That was when we had about 150 um, we had about 150 events that we knew about around the world. In fact, we know there are a lot more events than we even knew about that were being registered on the One Health Day website because we were seeing on the One Health Day Facebook and Twitter page events that people were talking about that we didn't have registered. Um, and right now we've got about another 20 or 25 to actually log in and enter. I encourage you to go to the One Health Day webpage. It's under events on the commission and actually look at some of the um, event descriptions that people were putting together all around the world. This has exceeded our wildest expectations. And what you're getting is a visual image of where this whole One Health concept has taken root around the world. Next slide, Nikki. So another relatively new initiative that the Commission is working on right now is starting to try to uh, put in place a platform for taking One Health education K through 12 to take it down to younger people because um, we feel that that's where you really can um, institute, institute, uh, institute change is taking it to young people. Um, so some of you might be interested. Tomorrow we're actually holding an online conference uh, just to discuss this. If any of you are interested in participating and helping us uh, figure out just how to structure this platform because we hope to make it global in scope 
and to um, help us find ways to fund and establish a One Health educational platform for K through 12 and beyond for undergrads and grads and the professional school. Next slide. This is not something that the commission has um, taken a leadership part in, but it is something I wanted to make everybody aware of just in case they aren't. The Smithsonian Institute is right now, as we speak, creating a Zoonoses and One Health exhibit. They've raised enough money for this exhibit not just to ha be housed in the, um, the museum for two to three years. It's coming to be supposed to be opening in 2018. But for um, uh, the exhibit in its entirety or parts of it to actually travel around the world. So just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, Dan Lucy, who's on the commission's board for Georgetown University Medical Center, actually went to the Smithsonian because uh, he had been working in the Ebola epidemic over on boots on the ground over in um, Sierra Leone and I forget the other country now. Um, and so he took this idea to the Smithsonian um, exhibit planning team and they got it in a big way and they realized just how incredibly important this uh, could be for um, um, educating the public about zoonotic diseases and one health and just how much it could contribute to global security. Next slide. The Commission is also trying to participate in the Global Health Security Agenda's non-governmental organization consortium. Um, if any of you are not aware of the, the Global Health Security Agenda, it was actually headed by the State Department here in the U.S. and was have set in, um, in practice a way for, to help countries evaluate their preparedness for medical crises, um, disease crises, or disasters, and to help them start putting into place the, the, what the structures and um, infrastructure that they need to be prepared. Next slide, Nikki. And um, like I mentioned before, we believe that um, that One Health is a path to planetary health and global security, but it's also a path for us to attain the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So if you look at all these goals, and once you really understand this whole One Health concept, you'll realize that we can help we can help accomplish this, and that's part of what we're trying to to do with our. Um, um, kind of changing in our in our One Health education platform to change our attitudes and our understanding of our place on Earth and how we need to not be destroying our Earth, but we need to be protecting the animals and the environment for our own sustainability. Next slide, Nikki. So I had asked you to remember that this is a really important point to take away, that collaborations don't just magically happen. They start with relationships. And those don't happen unless we have opportunities to share and have direct conversations. So that's one of the things we're trying to do in the One Health movement is to give us those opportunities and make us aware of our areas of our intersections so that we can can um, work together um, to address some of our most wicked problems. No one profession, no one country, no one region, no one organization can have all the answers. We're going to have to face all of our problems such as animal cover resistance and climate change. We're going to have to do it working together. Next slide, Nikki. Just a reminder that this can be a pathway to planetary health and global security. And the final slide, Nikki. I hope that um, some of what we've said today will give you food for thought. I would love to hear from any of you. If there are any of you on this call that were not familiar with One Health, if um, you're learning about it, if, if, you, if it resonates with you and you'd like to, to learn more or get in, more involved, then we'd be very, very happy to, to have a conversation with you. Um, my email address, I should have put it on this slide. It's all over the One Health Commission website under leadership, um, cstroud at onehealthcommission.org. Let us hear from you. We would love to, um, to especially from some of the, the human clinicians and some of the newcomers to the One Health Conversation, we would love to help, help you find a way to get involved and help us accomplish this. So that's it from me for right now, Nikki. Thank you so much, Dr. Stroud. We will now open the lines for the question and answer session. As a reminder, you may press star one on the phone to put yourself in the queue for questions. Please state your name and then ask your question, or you may submit questions to the webinar system by selecting the Q&A tab at the top of the webinar screen and typing in your question there. Um, for our first question, um, Dr. Stroud, you mentioned uh, the webinar that lasted about 10 hours. Can you talk more about some of the key players there and what were some of the highlights and takeaways? Sure. So I'm glad I'm sitting at my computer so I can actually go and call it up and tell you some of the speakers that we had in that first one. Um, the takeaway is we were just starting to learn who all was doing what. Um, 
So we had in that call speakers from Africa, from Uganda. Um, we had Gladys Kalama speaking about her conservation through uh, public health through conservation work. Somebody from Brazil talking about their efforts in Brazil to advance the One Health concept. We had Karen Artisan from One Health Sweden, and we had Dr. Laura Kahn, who I mentioned earlier. She's from the, um, part of the One Health Initiative team. Uh, she was talking about their efforts in the One Health Initiative uh, website. Um, we had a uh, small animal, uh, the small companion animal, the veterinary, excuse me, I'll just in a minute, the World Small Animal Veterinary Association, and Michael Day talking about uh, the One Health Committee of that organization, Bonnie Buntain from uh, up in Canada at that time, talking about transdisciplinary approaches to One Health up in Canada. We had um, Katinka de Below from the SAO OIE, and I'm basically just reading down the list of things that you can go see on your own computer on the One Health Commission website um, on the first international who's who in One Health. Um, and so those recordings are there if you'd like to listen, and the same thing for the one that we've just uh, done, the second one, international who said that we just did on November 4th. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we have another question. Um, the obstacles and barriers to collaboration and moving one help forward are substantial and significant. Um, what do you see as a reasonable early strategy to address them? Uh, just what we're doing now and more of it. I think the, the more we can join hands and keep talking about this and bringing it to the public's attention and to our lawmakers and policymakers' attention, you're hearing One Health spoken and understood a whole lot more right now in Washington, D.C. than it ever has been. I have no idea what it's going to be like going forward. But just the more we can do um, to bring the, you know, the significance of this One Health thinking forward, the more One Health teaching lessons we can provide, um, then the further along we'll be. I, I, don't have, you know, I don't think any of us have a magic bullet or a magic answer to that question. We just have to keep, um, just keep swimming. As I don't know if any of you saw um, Finding Nemo, the Disney movie, the, the, the silly little female fish that, that gave me my current life's mantra. She said, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Brad, do we have any questions on the phone? We've had no responses from the phones at this time, Miss. Okay. It uh, looks like we have another question through the Q&A system. Um, Dr. Stroud, what do you want uh, human and veterinary clinicians to do? You know, that's a really good question because I think it's hard for practitioners especially, well, both the human and the veterinary practitioners, to figure out just how, when they're standing in their exam rooms, they can um, be aware and make this whole One Health conversation happen. I would urge you to, in your communities, look for ways to meet each other, create those relationships. So get the veterinarian down the road or, you know, go and talk with your pediatrician if you're a veterinarian. Open those relationships so that if you have cases or situations that you should be collaborating on or if you have a patient, um, that you, you think that you could um, share information with that patient. Um, if you're a veterinarian, you have uh, an animal that's got a situation and you think it should shed, you could shed light for that um, human owner's own doctor, then don't be intimidated to create those relationships and pick up the phone and call each other and talk to each other. That's what we've lost the ability to do is to be in touch with each other. So, so to look for ways to, to do that, it's not that hard to do once you've kind of opened your mind to realizing that you really need to open these conversations. If you're in the exam room, say you're an emergency doc, then be sure that you're asking the questions or that your um, intake patient um, um, questionnaires are asking if they have exposure to um, animals or what their occupations are and what their environmental risks are. I know some of us, some of us are already doing that, but it's, uh, I'm pretty surprised at the number of places where, like this young woman um, that I was telling you the story about, you know, they never really put it together that she had just been traveling and she was sick and they had not really kind of been able to put that together. Um, or maybe the radiologist didn't know that she had been traveling and had had these other signs. So just be sure that we're setting up our systems so that we can enhance this whole um, one health awareness and take action to make sure that those kinds of questions are being asked and that those relationships are being formed. Thank you. Um, quickly, we have time for one last question. 
Um, Dr. Stroud, what do you think of the human-animal bond as an early win in terms of bringing more decision makers and the general public into the One Health fold? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. What do you think of the human-animal bond as a, quote, early win in terms of bringing more people or more decision makers and the general public into the One Health fold? I wish we could talk more about the human-animal bond in the One Health conversation anyway. Um, I think it would be a great win-win. Um, that's one of the, uh, one, the action teams that I would love to stand up. Um, there's actually an organization, the Human Animal Bond Research Institute, that is trying to bring awareness and bring forward research on the benefits of the human animal bond. There's so many benefits other than you know, seeing our animals as sentinels for disease, but the, the, the mental um, um, benefits, both for the people and the animals, this whole idea of well-being is, is not getting enough attention. Um, so I, the human-animal bond is a huge part of this conversation, and I think it would be a tremendous win-win. And whoever asked that question, if you'd like to help me stand up an action team to start doing things to, to bring that um, to more awareness, then please give me a call or, or contact me. Dr. Stroud, thank you so much for your presentation today. On behalf of CDC's Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity, I would also like to thank everyone uh, for joining today. Free continuing education is available for this call. If you would like to receive continuing education, you should complete the online evaluation by December 16, 2016, using course code WC2286. For those who will view the archived webinar after December 16th, complete the online evaluation between December 17, 2016, and November 16, 2018, using course code WD2286. All continuing education and contact dollars for COCA conference calls are issued online through TCE Online, CDC's training and continuing education online system at www, the number two, the letter A, dot CDC dot GOV forward slash TCE online. Again, that's www, the number two, the letter A, dot CDC dot GOV forward slash TCE online. To receive information on upcoming COCA calls, subscribe to COCA by sending an email to COCA at CDC dot GOV and write subscribe in the subject line. Today's webinar will be archived on the COCA call webpage and available next week. The call audio, webinar, and transcript will also be available. Please visit COCA's website at emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA forward slash calls for materials from today's call. Please join us for our next COCA call, Assessment and Evidence-Based Treatments for Opioid Use Disorder on Tuesday, November 29th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Also, CDC has launched a Facebook page for clinicians. Please like our page at facebook.com forward slash CDC Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity to receive COCA updates. Thank you again for being part of today's webinar. We hope everyone has a nice day. Thank you for your participation on today's conference call. Please disconnect at this time.